Oh, was Tom from Israel? I think we got you. Oh, we got Ted from France. Ted from France. Awesome. All right, cool. I think the recording started. Uh, let's see if it works. If it doesn't work, then better stick around. Plus, we'll announce the uh, winner live. So welcome everyone to this uh, webinar about how to get 98% of your emails delivered. And without further ado, let's, uh, let's see. So if you're sticking around, this is what we're going to cover. We're going to cover how to avoid aggressive spam filters. This is becoming a problem uh, these years. Um, in the past, I remember the Far West time. Uh, it was only a couple of years back where you could just basically just uh, send anything and then uh, be fine. This is obviously over. And how to reduce spam complaints and how to keep uh, high engagement and how to scale the easy way, which is basically in order. First, you try to avoid the spam filter in order to get delivered. Then you want to reduce the number of spam complaints that people um, could potentially do. You do that by engaging or, or increasing your engagements. And then once you got all of that, you can then look into scaling to get uh, more replies. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, who am I? Hopefully most of the people know me here. If they don't know me, then that's still fine. I've been running quickmail.io for like the last seven years of my life. Uh, I love it. And quickmail.io is a software that helps you send cold outreach at scale, um, mostly by email, uh, actually. Uh, I wrote a, a book on cold uh, email uh, quite some time ago, and I have like two courses on uh, call outreach, one for deliverability specifically, and one that will take you from not nothing enough, not knowing anything about call email to you know becoming a master in call email. And I'm also the co-host of a podcast uh, called Outreach with Jeremy and Jack. I think it's something like that. I co-host this podcast with Jack. We do an episode every week. Jack is the founder of a lead generation agency. So it's a nice little balance between I have the technical side and the data, and he has the sort of like know-how um, about the, um, you know, just, just doing the outreach uh, himself. Okay, cool. So why deliverability matters? Um, Obviously, you hear that means there is some problem potentially with deliverability. Deliverability is simple. It's just basically if I'm sending an email, my recipient should receive it. And it's really nothing more like that. So in theory, that should be super simple. I'm sending an email, someone received the email, job done. The problem we have for is that there are a lot of things that impact the deliverability on that journey. So between actually uh, sending the email and someone receiving the email, there are a lot of things that could go wrong. Now, I... I listed them most, most of the one that came through my head, but they are, I, I try to also put them into section. We have a setup section, we have a content section and everything I, you know, I couldn't really find out in, into the other. And one thing that people don't necessarily realize is that deliverability should be like a conscious, a conscious drive from the get go. Like when you're actually setting up your ESP, which is either you're using Google or using Outlook or using something else, you already by default, setting yourself up for high or low deliverability straight away. Like for example, if you're going for Microsoft uh, inbox like Outlook, you will have a slightly better deliverability than if you go for Google, um, Google Suite. You will have more pain going through their support as I, as I mentioned quickly earlier, but technically you should see between five and 10% increase in your open rate. That's what we've seen by just analyzing all data, analyzing all the inboxes that we have. Even for the market, it's probably 90, 95% uh, inboxes are on uh, G Suite, uh, basically Google and, uh, and Gmail. So that's an interesting point straight away. That said, you can do very, very well with having a Google inbox. So that's not the determining factor, but it has some impact. Like pretty much everything, there's not like one silver bullet, but a lot of things will impact your deliverability. So the second thing you want to look at is also your domain. You're not going to send e call outreach, especially in a B2B business to business environment. You're going to say, you're not going to send to free emails like uh, at hotmail.com, uh, at gmail.com, at uh, uh, what's the other one? Like outlook.com is going to be sent from your own domain. And that is when you need to pick up a domain. So you're going to pick up, I don't know, my computer or my, my superservice.com or .io or .net, .org, .co. 
And you may think that it has no impact, but it actually has a slight impact. Usually looking at all the data that we have on QuickMail, it looks like the .co is the one that actually performed um, not so well. And I think it's probably because a lot of the .co come for free when people are joining Startup Weekends. And so they get like a new domain, they try it, and the first thing they do is they spam everyone. And so there is a slight uh, problem on deliverability here. So if you can send it from either .com or .net, um, that's kind of easy. Like for me personally, when I do outreach, I have the quickmail.io, which is my main domain. And then we have the, I have the quickmail.com, which is my specific outreach domain. So I use the .com. I also use another IO domain, which is quickmailapp.io. That's also another domain that I use as sort of backup is the first one, um, you know, has problem with deliverability. Um, the interesting thing is you could see it as pretty much like if you pay a lot for those domain, there is less chances that it's going to be spammy because people don't want to trash it very often. Where spammer, on the other hand, will just simply buy a lot of cheap domains and start, um, you know, spamming. The other thing uh, that is sort of like monetary in this year um, and previous year as well, but it's the SPF and DKIM. This is purely a setup thing and it's a technical thing. It basically means when someone is sending an email from that domain, it can't be spoofed. So it had to be from that domain. And so nowadays when an email is received, is the SPF is failing or the DKIM is failing, it's going to be an easy reject because they don't want, you know, people to spoof other people. So it's also to protect the recipient. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, we're going to move to content, uh, which is the second thing that could potentially impact your deliverability. So on the content side, you basically manage to send your email. So that's really good. So my email is being sent and now is getting on the receiving end. And on the receiving end, a lot of things could also happen badly. And most of the time, this is the role of the spam filter. So the spam filter are going to look for different things, uh, whether you're in uh, a blacklist, whether you have some words that are not uh, ideal, like for example, I challenge you to send an email to even a friend that contains the word Viagra, like buy Viagra. I mean, I tried that with uh, some friends and yeah, sure enough, even though we had a lot of communication together, that email goes straight um, into spam. So that's kind of the role of the spam filter to categorize where that should land. Um, so that's what I mean by risky content, like be careful about what you put. Like if you say like open, you know, great free offer, guaranteed, those sort of like spammy, salesy type of words, you're going to have a, um, a slightly higher chance to end up in spam than if you're using a you know, different type of language. So I will encourage you to sometime look at your content. Now on the technical side, uh, there is also links and trackings. And what I mean by that is when you're putting the open tracking uh, when you turn on the open tracking or the, the click tracking, you're going to add a URL somehow in your email. And spam filters are going to be very suspicious of, of links um, because from that you can send them to uh, a website to you know scan them or do other things um, that are fishy. And basically the spam filters will look at those links and see if they are good or not. Um, one way you can do that one way you can improve that is by not adding links, simple enough, not adding open tracking. And if you do want to have that, you can use what we call custom domain tracking, which means the domain under which you're sending, so in my case, let's say I'm using quickmail.com, is going to also use links that are quickmail.com slash something. And that way it's less suspicious, but it will be very suspicious if I send something from quickmail.com and my link is like paypal you know, um, send me money at paypal.com, something like that. So it'll be, it'll be slightly more, um, you will have a greater chance of going to the spam folder. Now, the last category is a bit more about, you know, everything I can think of. Basically, when you're going to reach out to your audience, especially in a cold outreach type of environment, it's better to make sure that you're contacting people in a B2B uh, type of environment. It's much more less, uh, it's much more forgiving. You will have less chances of getting um, quickly rejected. We're going to see why uh, in, a, um, in a few slides. Uh, the inbox category means where you're going to land. It could be that you're getting delivered, but the content of your email is slightly salesy. And so you end up in the promotional tab. That's also something like it's in between, it's between the spam folder 
and the inbox. The blacklist, as I mentioned, there are different types of blacklists. The one you should really pay attention to is not the IP blacklist uh, because you have no control over IP generally. It's, the, it's determined by what ESP you're currently using. Um, but it will be checking what links you're sending. So for example, if you're sending a bit.ly link, then uh, there is a high chance that it will be blacklist and then a spam filter will not even check um, your email. It will say, oh, it contains an email that uh, a URL that is from that blacklist. And therefore I'm going to reject this email. Bounce rates, uh, if you keep on having all your email that bounce, your sender provider will say like, what's going on here? It's mostly like your spammer or someone who's trying to reach out to a lot of people they don't know. Because let's be honest, when I'm sending, you know, when I'm sending emails to my friends, sure it may bounce because maybe they change job or other different reason, but most of the time my email will actually reach out the other person. So high bounce uh, is actually um, an indicator that what you're doing uh, is spammy. And so your ESP may decide to prevent your emails from being sent. And the volume is kind of like similar. It will sort of like raise um, uh, a red flag. Okay, great question about Paul, like what bounce rate it should be. I think this is a perfect question for the QA. Keep it, uh, keep it Paul, and then ask it at the QA, and I'm more than happy to share what I believe the bounce rate uh, should be for an outreach um, um, campaign. All right, that's great. All those things can impact, can impact your deliverability. That's a lot of them uh, for a very simple thing, which is sending an email, receiving an email. Um, but you may wonder, like, how do I assess it? Like, okay, I get it. There's lots of risk. Well, how do I assess it? And unfortunately, there's not a very easy answer. What we're doing most of the time is we're using some sort of like proxy. Or in this case, I got A, B, C, which are like three ways of assessing your deliverability. And the, the easiest one or the, the more secure one, in a sense, is to use your reply rate. Why the reply rate? Because simply if someone replies, that means they receive the email and actually send you the email, which is, to be honest, uh, the, the best proof that they actually received it. The problem about replies and also on subscribe requests, like take me off your list and things like that, that uh, it, not all the people who receive it will actually reply. So you're going to get a sort of like subset of your actual deliverability. So it's not ideal. And so people sort of like fall back, especially some people who don't have a lot of replies, they sort of fall back to the open rate or click rate. And unfortunately, those technology are not foolproof. And they are, they are kind of like proxy way to figure out what your deliverability is. But there are a lot of people who have email tracking turned off, which will impact your deliverability rate. Um, in fact, the new iOS 15 um, operating system on Apple will actually be released and it will remove all those open tracking technology. So that will make it even harder. You may actually see an impact on the open tracking because of that. And the click rate, like I mentioned, the spam filter may be worried about like what link are you actually providing? And so uh, that will also impact your deliverability. So those two are not ideal, but yet it's it's probably the thing that is the most used. What I'd like you to consider for is the sample size. Now, the sample size is the idea that if I send an email to 10 people or 10 inbox I never reached out to in the past, um, how many of those inbox do I actually receive a reply to? And people are doing that by buying multiple inboxes and then sending things. Now, there are tools. We're going to see that later. But that's the idea. You send it to 10. You get how many people are getting delivered, how many people are not getting delivered, and you scale that to the size of your campaign. Uh, that's what is done, you know, honestly, for political pools. They don't survey the entire population. They only survey like a small subset and then extrapolate. And after that, they say, roughly, you have, you know, a, a two to five percent, you know, uh, difference. Hopefully that makes sense. Those are like the three ways to assess your deliverability. Now, a question for you, I've been talking a lot, so I'm going to take a zip of, uh, of my drink. But question for you, what do you think an average open rate for, you know, across all industries for marketing emails? And the difference between marketing emails and cool outreach emails is that the marketing emails is people who actually opt in to, let's say, a newsletter. So I'm opting in a newsletter. How much do you think that is? We got 30% 30, 30 with Alex, 18% for his Fabrizio. Oh, I'm going to enjoy that. All right, keep. Keep it going, guys. We got 20%. Meg, you're cheating. 30 to 40. Make a pick. Is it 30 or is it 40? 8% with Brian. Okay. 
Okay, we are now we're talking. Okay, third <laughs> in the middle, Meg. That's that's a good one. Cool. Is that as well? You're gonna have to choose. Is it also a 35%? We've got a 17% for Top. Hey, nice to see you, Top, joining us as well. 9.6 for Dom. 30. All right, let me just grab a drink and then we'll move to the answer. That's pretty cool. I'm enjoying it. No one said 80%. 10% for Jessica. All right. Um, this is 21.33%. Now this is, this is coming from MailChimp. Um, they've done a, a study across all their, um, their, the emails that they actually sent, uh, in the year of 2019. They did it nicely per industry as well. I have the link. I can send it to you. And basically when they average everyone, they, they're more or less all around like 20%. So they, they hover, right? But it is like 21.33%, uh, which means that either their deliverability is absolutely atrocious, like I wouldn't trust a email sender provider to send my emails to people who expect my emails because they're in the newsletter to like 80% are actually not getting delivered. So obviously the story is different. It's a proxy and obviously there are more people that are getting delivered, but only 21.33% are opening the email, which is um, super low. Uh, if you think about it, because you're on the mailing list, you're supposedly receiving these emails. Now, here an interesting thing, an interesting picture. Um, I don't think anyone would have seen that before. This is basically, unless they hacked your server, but I don't think so. It's basically the open rate on a per campaign. So I basically took all the campaigns in the last six months and placed them as to how many, uh, what were the open rates. So we could see there was like quite a lot here, but like 13% open rate. Uh, they were far less in the 97% open rate. So just a few campaigns had a rich 97% open rate. So if you look at it, the MailChimp stuff, like they just end up around, you know, around the 20% here. Now you may wonder why there is that sort of like big increase here. There are a few things that could explain this. The first one uh, that you can think is that a lot of people try a quick mail. They do like something very quickly with an inbox that is not very valid. Or, or that had bad, poor reputation, they see it, it doesn't work, or they don't get in enough deliver deliverability, and then they stop. That's one way. What I think as well is also playing here is that by default, what we do in quick mail is if you actually have a reply, but your prospect didn't actually open the email, we think it's impossible. You can't really get a reply if someone didn't actually open your email and replied. So what we do is we trigger, we consider this prospect as having opened it. And, and that's one thing that, uh, that, that will contribute to that. But the other thing as well is like not everyone has um, email tracking turned on, which means that even for 30% maybe having opening, if only 2% only replied, then you will be in a 2% category. And I think that's why those sort of like campaigns are. So if you exclude that, or you think that they are basically just ending up in junk, what you end up here is like roughly uh, the average of, or like the, the, the peak of the, uh, the curve should be around between 60 and 70%. So if you reach between 60 and 70%, I think you're fine, basically. So what, what can we actually extract from those data? Uh, there are a few, that was actually fun to do, but we realized that 20% of the campaigns have an open rate that is less than 20%. Like I mentioned, that could be simply because they have, you know, open tracking turned off, but when they get replied, then you automatically increase their, their open, open, um, uh, open rates. The second thing is like one third of the campaign have more than 60%. So it's actually not too bad. If you think about it, like one third of the campaigns that are running on quick mail, actually no problem with deliverability at all. Like if you have 60% deliverability, then I think you're, 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 you're okay. You're very okay. If you have, and then here you have like 8% of the campaign that are more than 80%. So those ones are performing extremely well. And when you reach the 80%, like, you know, deliverability is not a problem. Everyone just opened the door for you and you can be pretty sure that if you send an email, someone will receive it, uh, which will make your reply rate more accurate as well. Because if you send a hundred email, but you have a very poor deliverability, let's say half of it, then when you get a reply, it's really a reply out of 50, not a reply out of hundred, right? That makes sense. Now, 
with all of this considered into account, that makes your open rate on QuickMail as an average at 44%. And you may say, wow, this is great. This is like twice better than, than, Mail, than MailChimp. But there are a few caveats here, and that's why I put a small asterisk. The first one is that MailChimp is a B2C, which means you know it's people, uh, individual people inboxes, where the quick mail is more like B2B, B2B, which means it's people at work opening your email. So when you actually, that means that B2B are, you know, in, in average, a better open rate than uh, B2C. And the other thing is, like I mentioned, when you get a reply, we consider it or a click, we consider that it can't happen unless that person actually opened the email. And so therefore, we adjust the open rate to sort of be more accurate. So overall, that's what we have here. Okay, so I didn't want to leave you with just like random data. This is an example, and the example I took is simply my last campaign. This is running uh, live at the moment. Um, I think we got about like 700 people that run through it. It's over, you know, uh, a few months because we don't do the high volume game uh, on purpose, and I explain you later. But basically, we got 82.44 percent, which you can see here. That means 600 um, prospect actually opened it out of 750 or something like that like we currently have. Uh, we have a bounce rate of 2.54. Uh, I think this is okay. So for, um, damn, I don't recall who actually asked me that, but someone asked me about the bounce rate. Uh, this is an okay bounce rate. If you have less than 4%, I think you're really good. If you have uh, more than 9%, you really need to revisit your, your, your strategy. So where does that place us like that 82% on the map that we've seen? So that places us about here. And you can see that it is harder and harder to get like a higher um, open rate. And that's totally normal. It could also be due to different industry you're contacting. So that should vary. But again, if you keep between 60 and 70, I think you're, you're in good shape. The reply. I want you to also analyze the reply, but the reply is a slightly different story. It basically is a long tail type of thing. And it, it basically is a story is that it's harder and harder to get higher and higher reply rates, which kind of makes sense. And a lot of those campaigns are like this. Now, how do I explain that? Uh, typically, it's because when you start at call outreach, it's very, you have to have a baseline. It's very difficult. There's a lot of things that you need to learn. And so that means that, you know, your first campaign are not going to be as good as people who run that, for example, on a regular basis. And so that's why you got a lot of those. Like some of my campaigns, when I start them, they just, uh, they just generated crickets. And so you have to revisit them and then replay, uh, until you get a certain, a certain good percentage. My, um, advice is that you should at least reach 10%. Once you reach 10%, then I think you start to enter the world of things that work. Between 10 and 20%, I think that's where the game is at. More than 20%, you hit really a nerve and you're actually, you know, you're actually acing it. And that's really good. Uh, here are some of the uh, conclusion that I got from those data. Half of the campaigns don't do more than 10%, which means to me that half of the campaign currently uh, running um, in the last six months didn't actually generate in more than 10%, which means those campaigns were not working yet, right? Like I mentioned, that could be a small campaign, run, didn't work, iterate, and then future work. But right now, uh, out of those data, 50% of them are not working, which is kind of depressing if you think about it. So here are some good news. 25% or a quarter of it uh, have actually a good reply rate. So between 10 and 20%. So that means one of the four campaigns is actually generating a pretty reasonable reply rate between 10 and 20%, which is pretty awesome. Uh, another one is like 20% of the campaign have more than 20% reply. And you're going to like, well, hold on a second. It doesn't really look like that on the, on the graph. And I had to recalculate that multiple times, but it is a long tail game. If you look at it, and I'm going to come back very quickly here, but if you look at it, everything above like this, if you calculate all of this and you add all of this, you know, it actually just, at, uh, it actually does lead to 20%. So 20% of the campaigns have actually generate more than 20% of replies, which is uh, pretty awesome to see. So here's my uh, campaign. So we'll come back to my campaign. We're having like a 17% percent um, uh, reply rate. So it's not fantastic, but it's not bad either. I think it's a really good, uh, healthy reply, which means that between the 10 and 20, you're in that luxury phase where you can decide, do I keep on improving my campaign or do I keep it as is? 
right? And it depends again on the size of your market and things like that. But again, when you got like 83% uh, in open rates and you got 17% in reply rates, I think your deliverability is not so much of an issue. Uh, that's where it places us uh, on the map. So just as a curiosity thing, uh, having that uh, reply rate. So that's where my campaign is, which means like I'm preaching what I'm actually doing, right? All right, so you're gonna tell me like, Jeremy, how, you know, is there any tool that helps me assessing my, my deliverability and even monitoring it? Well, you have a few things, none are ideal, none are perfect, because like I mentioned, unfortunately, unless you're the email sender provider, both at the sending end and at the receiving end, it's going to be very hard to have an accurate number and they won't let you know most of the time if they do. But you do have a few tools, you can use MX tools in order to figure out if your links are actually blacklisted or not. So we will check around all the uh, blacklists. Or it will, um, or you can use block apps, which will actually be the sample size thing you send to a certain number of inboxes, and then you're going to get a report. Maybe let's say 78% are actually uh, going well. Then you can extrapolate that to your campaign. Um, mail tester is going to be the technical stuff, making sure you got um, the um, SPF, M, um, DKIM properly set up, and even your content. Like, is that going to be uh, raising any flag for spam or not. And otherwise you, you can use also quick mail. We pretty much have like a mini, a mini version of all those tools here. Uh, this is just an example, uh, shameless plug. This is just an example of the report you're going to receive every, every week. This is my own personal report. Like I mentioned, quickmail.com is my outreach, uh, inbox. And you can see this is pretty healthy. Um, right now, so I can, my SPF is actually properly set up. My DKM is properly set up. I end up into the personal folder, which is basically the inbox as opposed to the promotional tab. Uh, and then it's, uh, it's all green. Like it all goes into inbox. If he doesn't go, then it will show you as spam. And this is my own personal domain as well. So every week it's a good way to check your deliverability here. All right. Now you're delivering uh, potentially, so you addressed all the potential impact that you have during deliverability. The problem is that you're not, um, this thing that can still go wrong. One of the things simply is people receive the email and say, ah, this is crap, I don't want this email. Uh, and then they just flag it as spam. Um, um, I don't think I'm teaching anyone anything. Like uh, this is a question I'm expecting a lot of yes, but have you ever been flagged have you ever yourself flag an email as spam? Like you receive an email and you click spam. I'm curious to see. Okay, we got Alex, of course. Um, yeah, Fabrizio <laughs> with a smiley face. Um, yes, many times for his ad. Yep. So Paul, you know, like Daniel. Okay, I get you guys. Uh, we all did it. We all flag things as spam. Uh, on a personal note, actually, I only flag spam when people are reaching me on a group that has nothing to do. Like for example, if they reach me at vulnerability at quick mail or abuse at quick mail, which is kind of funny and ironic in a sense. Um, if people are reaching me at abuse at quick and they do me a pitch about sending me something, then clearly I will flag them as spam because they didn't do their research. Everything else, most of the time, either I delete it as a nice person that I am, uh, not always, or actually put them into a special folder that have called outreach. And I will use that as a teardown uh, episode on the podcast. So if you're enjoying those side of teardowns, then you can definitely tune it to our podcast. But point is everyone flag uh, people at spam. And so we can't really expect that our recipient will never flag us as spam. Um, here are some of the four top four reasons why I think that people are flagging people as spam. Uh, or email actually as spam. The first one is about um, content. It's in no particular order. I told you about the group. If you're sending something to the wrong group, like let's say abuse at quickmail.io, there's a chance that people will flag you as spam. But if you also send to things like sales at quickmail.io, for example, or or marketing at quickmail.io, those sort of like generic groups, what will happen is like a lot of people will read your email. And so there are even more chances of people to flag you as spam. And so that's not something that you want. You don't want to multiply your ability of, uh, of being flagged as spam. You want to send to one person, ideally. Uh, and don't BCC either. This is terrible. Content. 
what I mean by content is if, for example, it's, it's super easy. Like this is like, I don't know, uh, a discount for a hotel holiday. And, you know, I'm at work and I'm, and I'm expecting work email. Clearly everyone will flag it as spam. You can do your own analysis as to why you will flag as spam, but that's definitely one of the big reasons. Hopefully no one on this webinar is doing that. But the second thing that comes is obviously the list. And what I mean by that is if I'm selling something, uh, let's say, you know, um, I'm going to be terrible with examples. So let's, let's talk in generality. Let's say I have a product I want to sell, but my list is receiving this offer has no interest in that product. And it's obvious they have no interest in that product. Then people are just going to flag your spam because your targeting was off. Your list is actually not, um, in, uh, aligned with actually the product you're trying to sell. And so that's super important. Make sure your list are potential prospect that will benefit from the proposition that you're sending. So that's that's an important thing. And B2C uh, is a very clear one. We've been um, rejecting a lot of people or, or probably warning a lot of people not to use QuickMail when it comes to B2C specifically. If you have a Kickstarter and you just purchase a list, for example, this is a terrible, terrible idea simply because B2C has a higher tendency of putting people people emails in spam rather than B2B. B2B, you can understand someone's trying to sell you something or, or let you know about a product, that's fine. On the personal inbox, that's that that should not be fine. And so we recommend personally, if you do have a B2C product, you can still use Outreach, but we recommend you actually go to um, uh, VIP, what we call it. So people who can then open um, open your product to more customer. Like an example will be you go to a retailer and you ask, you know, if they'd be interested in listing on your product rather than actually to the end user. Or it could be going to group influencer or influencers proposing, you know, giving them a proposition to promote your product, but not actually, you know, the end customer. And I think that that works better. Uh, if you do those mistakes, you're going to be flagged as spam very quickly and your delivery will go uh, down the toilet very, very quickly. Okay, here are a few ways to... Uh, oh, we got someone mentioning sending frequency. Yes, I think uh, that is this slide, right? Uh, good, mo good move, good move, Top. So um, DNC domain uh, is something we have in QuickMail, which every tool should really have anyway. It's a list of domains that you don't want to send to. So one of the things you can prevent yourself from any blunder, any mistakes is simply add things like a domain like it's gmail.com or hotmail.com or yahoo.com, those sort of domains so that you make sure that whatever is your prospecting, you're never going to contact those domain, right? That could also be, um, that could also be your list of clients, your list of competitors, uh, people you don't want to receive uh, emails because um, because you think that this could actually lead to to more um, uh, to more spam complaints. The subject line is uh, something that um, I I pay a lot of attention to. That should not be misleading. Things that are like R E like you're replying to something and it's the first email you're sending is misleading. Subject line that are misleading, clickbaiting, people are going to make you pay for it. And the way they make you pay for it is by simply putting you, uh, flagging you as spam. Personalization is something that you can do. Put a little bit of effort in personalizing the email that goes a long way toward not getting flagged as spam. Like even for, you know, I may not be the right person and sometimes I, I, I screwed up with some personalization. Um, then you do have people just, you know, either answering or isn't like deleting your email, but they're usually not going to the extent of flagging you as spam because you still make an effort, right? Of course, you're going to have uh, some jerks like everywhere in the world, but that proportion is much, it's greatly reduced versus like an email that has zero personalization whatsoever. So I'm talking more about just the first name. I'm talking about like, you know, um, hey, I, I love your last blog article about XYZ or thanks for, you know, uh, doing what you're doing with this organization, whatever kind of thing. That's what I call personalization. It's not just the first name. Uh, but you do find some email with no first name, no personalization whatsoever. Those ones are easy to flag as spam because it's just laziness, sloppiness, and people are penalized in um, email sender for that. Uh, the frequency, I'm going to touch quickly on that. Uh, you can increase your number of replies by increasing the frequency. An example would be uh, if I send an email today, I send another email tomorrow and send a follow-up the day after, you go going to get more replies, which is amazing. You get more replies. But the problem with this is that um, you're going to get more annoyed replies and people will more 
uh, easily uh, flag you as spam. All right. Um, Subject lines, uh, I've talked about it. And half, si half list is uh, something that I like to always think of is if you have a list of a thousand prospects and you're currently doing 10% reply rates, think about like, or, or even 5%, how can I actually halve the size and still obtain the same number of replies, which basically will mean doubling your reply rates, right? So uh, when you're going to go through this exercise, you're going to think like, what are better better um better company uh that will fit my criteria better and then you will find maybe actually it's only the company that get funded and the bootstrap company are not you know converting as well so therefore you're going to remove the bootstrap company those sort of exercises are really good exercise to iterate on your on your reply rate and increase that uh, while making sure you minimize the number of spam complaints because you have a greater chance of matching what the prospect is expecting to receive, or at least bring some value with your email. All right, um, positive engagement. What is it? Well, think about it. You manage to send an email, and then it's being uh, it's being received. You manage to not end up being flagged as spam. So so far so good. We can still you can still over time actually lose deliverability. And the reason for it is that people may not engage with your email. They may glance at it and then boom, and then delete it, right? They didn't actually flag it as spam, which is great, but they may not have spent enough time on it and then just simply delete it. Over time, that's going to show. And that's one of the metrics that now ESP, email service provider, are using to figure out if your emails are good emails or bad emails. So you need a way to figure out how to engage positive engagement. And it, this is super important at the beginning when you don't have a good reply rate, you're still iterating, you're still figuring it out. Or if uh, you've done something bad, uh, been penalized and you want to then come back. Uh, one historical way of doing that was simply to send emails to your friends uh, or colleagues and just ask them like, hey, can you actually reply to me? Flag like it as not spam if it's been you know, in the spam folder, those sort of things. That's what we call positive engagement. People should click, people should look at it, people should uh, engage with it, replying, for example, people should do all those things, uh, just not just quickly delete and then move on. So how do we do that? Uh, one of the new things coming up, um, well, for a year now uh, almost, is to simply use auto warmer tools. So we got Alex already typing hot. Can you guys type hot uh, with exclamation mark? I didn't do this slide actually, but I found that's funny. So can you type hot with exclamation mark if you guys use an auto warmer? So we got uh, Ibrahim using hot, uh, Dom, Nick, Maggot, uh, is that hot, hot, hot even? Wow, that's cool. Um, we got Fabrizio, Maria, okay, awesome. So you guys, you guys are onto something. Oh, Paul, you're not using it. So there's two reasons why I would see not... Oh, Brian as well? You liar. I'm sure you're using it, Brian. Uh, actually, you're using your own one, if you're the Brian, I think you are. Anyway, um, Paul, the, the reason why you're not using it, can you can you write it, uh, please? The way I see it is you may not use the auto warmer in two reasons. The first one is you don't need it because you don't do code outreach. And the second one is you got exceptional reply rate. And usually that comes from... And then you're reaching out to people who expect something from you, whether it's like uh, um, a secret link access to something that they paid, for example, or something like that. Uh, that would be the reason why you would probably not use a warm-up tool when you have like enough engagement uh, on it. All right, so uh, I'm gonna go briefly about it because a lot of people know what huts are. Um, yeah, Brian wrote hut, but we may have like two Brian's on not hut. Oh, maybe I misread, not and hot, probably close enough. Anyway, warming up an inbox, what is it? I'm going to be brief on this one. It's simply a way to increase the engagement by doing a few things. Um, uh, it's going to um, automatically remove the flag spam. Like for example, it ends up into the flag uh, folder. Then the auto warmer should take this email and mark it as not spam to signal the ISP this email is not spam. Um, it should also reply from time to time and it should send the email automatically because quite frankly, you don't want to do it. The idea is you have a pool of inboxes. So the bigger the pool, the better it is because every day you're going to send random emails automatically. So that's done by the tool. And those emails are going to be landing on hopefully inboxes that never received your email. So we're doing the sampling data here, figuring out like if I'm sending like 10 emails a day, 
how many you know are going to end up in spam, how many are going to end up in inbox, how many are not going to get delivered. Once you got this information, you got a sort of like assessment on deliverability. But because we're also engaging with it automatically, like flagging it as not spam if they ended up in spam or automatically replying to those things, you're going to generate a lot of engagements as well. So it's great for generating engagement and also assessing your deliverability at the same time. That's why it becomes super popular. That's why it's being used uh, quite a lot. And that's why we provided one for QuickMail too. Now, um, when should I warm up an inbox? There's a whole lot of questions that actually come whenever we're talking about auto warmer. Uh, I receive a lot of questions from people starting the auto warmer as well as people already using it. Like we got some people coming from other auto warmer where they have to pay, they're coming to quick mail because it's free. And they just ask us like, okay, well, Jeremy, how much, you know, how many emails should I send? Like, should I pen like five a day? Should I put 50 a day? Should I put 10 a day? Um, and how long should I use that? Like, should I warm up my inbox for two weeks? Uh, uh, should I warm it up for four weeks? What should I, you know, how long is enough? Like two days is okay. What volume, like how many, you know, should I use? And uh, what type of emails um, uh, I should uh, I should use for, for warming up? So let's answer very briefly um, on those. The first thing is like, when should you use it? It's like always, always on your outreach inbox. Now, um, you should not just warm it up and then once in warm up, then start your call outreach because suddenly you're, there will be a big difference in the engagement. You're going to have like a lot of engagement where you're warming it up and then you're going to start your call outreach and you're going to get less engagement, which is normal. That's what um, you're contacting people you never talked before. And, and so you need to keep it on. Um, so how long do you need to warm up? If it's a new domain, I would recommend between two and four weeks. So it really depends uh, also on your volume. Try to match your volume with the actual volume you're going to use in your campaign and then slowly um, uh, and slowly transition uh, and keep a certain volume for um, for your uh, auto warmer. I recommend between 10 and 20%, but that should be a direct correlation as to how much your reply rate is. So if you're getting like 30% or 20% reply rate, you can go ahead with like a very small volume. But if you're getting like one or 2%, you're going to have to bump up the volume until you figure things out. And as for the types, um, you should pay attention if you're not using quick mail uh, for the auto warmer, you should pay attention as to what type of inbox that are in the pool and also uh, what type of content you also are sending. Like, are you sending fruit, vegetables? Like uh, I'm not a zookeeper, so I'm definitely not going to use that. So your outreach should also match the outreach, uh, your own outreach. So an AI can't actually make a difference between, oh, uh, well, you're using this language for this type of email and this language for those types of email. If this is your own personal inbox, I don't have the auto warmer turned on for my own personal inbox uh, simply because I don't need it. Like uh, I'm never actually reaching out cold. I'm always like engaging with existing clients. So there's no real need for me to be participating into the inbox. Um, uh, um, inbox warming up uh, system. All right, so I'm gonna make it super easy for you. Uh, usually they tell me like, oh, but you know, should I use this tool or this tool or this tool? Uh, for me, there is two types of categories of, of warm up tool. There is a paid version and there is free version and QuickMail is on the free version. You can go for the paid, but generally speaking, that doesn't actually provide you for a massive edge. Um, but that said, if, if you're the type of person that likes to pay, maybe for the reports or some stuff like that, then, you know, by all means, please do that. Otherwise, I think you'll be fine with the auto warmer on QuickMail. Just make sure whatever auto warmer you're taking that there are enough inboxes and there are real inboxes. Like they are not, uh, just inboxes created by the, uh, the, uh, the provider of the service and, uh, and they are just like monitoring those ones. Make sure that those are real inboxes used for also different type of conversation and just the auto warmer type of conversation. All right, here is how that looks like for an auto warmer. This is my own personal auto warmer report. Uh, you can see overall, this is a very healthy inbox. You can see my volume is not very high, but also my volume of email and outreach is not very high. We're contacting between, I'm personally contacting between 10 and 15 prospects every day, except Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, so that doesn't require a lot of them. Most of it is green, which means the inbox is, uh, is actually receiving uh, the inbox I'm sending that to automatically is receiving um, the email in the inbox and not in spam, not in promotional tab and, and stuff like that. You can see I'm ending up in promotional tab on a, on a few times, but overall, even like on, on spam, 
like I mentioned, if it's discovered on spam, then it gets unflagged as spam. And, you know, overall, this is a super healthy uh, inbox that we're having here. Uh, good, a good, good point from Maggot. Uh, problem with quick mail is we limit the number uh, of auto warmer to 10 inbox. This is something we're probably going to increase at some point. Uh, right now, we prefer to focus and help the people with low volume rather than trying to solve the big volume. Here's an example of the big volume. Someone asking me, hey, if I'm sending um, over 800 email warms up per day, do you think that can fix the problem? This is someone that I had a conversation with very recently in support. They were actually trying to max out their email. The conversation started by, can I send more than 1500 emails on one inbox? And very quickly that raised a red flag. And I told him like, well, you're going to have a very hard time to land, you know, in the inbox. And so they asked me, well, what if I send 800 emails warm up per day? Do you think that will fix the problem? My answer is no. The warm up is not that magic solution. It's something that will help support. It's not something that will replace engagement. And I think that's super, super important. So let me also be clear. You can send 1500 emails a day and have zero problem if you get a high, high, high reply rate. But most of the time, people that goes to 1500 emails a day are people who are trying to brute force the amount of replies um, they are getting by just sending more emails. And that's not okay. That's how it leads. Um, so it leads to auto warmer inbox like that. It looks like they're all going into spam and they're not really getting any better. And the reason for it is because the outreach is still over is still sending too many emails and uh, therefore the auto warmer just can't keep up with it. It can actually flag them all as non-spam, but that's, but the amount of other people that probably flag them as spam complain is too overwhelming. And so therefore you're never going to fix it. If you do realize that your inbox turns red, you should definitely keep the auto warmer, but stop your campaign and let it breathe a bit. And then over four to five weeks, uh, four to two to four weeks, sorry, that's going to reset more or less the reputation. And then you're going to start seeing more and more green. So not a magic pill, uh, definitely a really super helpful tool for. All right, I talked about, um, how to engage. Now we need to talk about how to scale. Let's say that now you manage to fix all the reality issue. You manage to avoid people sending you um, a spam. You, uh, you manage to have high engagement. Now you need to scale. And there is a right way of scaling and there is a bad way of scaling. So uh, before I go into that, I'd like to figure out how many people, how many inboxes do you guys use roughly on a per account? So Brian using two um, inboxes per account on average. Alex four. Meg two per person. I like I like that Meg. That's a really good smart move. Um, by account, I mean yeah, domain is fine. It's basically when you're doing your call outreach campaign, like how many inboxes do you actually plan on using? We got uh, two to four for Fabrizio. Uh, around four for Alex. Uh, two to four for Steven. So it varies for Nix. So, okay. So you guys are aware of how to actually, uh, scale and scaling is effectively by using probably more, uh, more inboxes. One thing, uh, one thing that we should really pay attention to is never, ever, ever scale until you nail down the list, the content and the engagement. If you do that, you only, if you don't do that and one of those is wrong, you're only going to accelerate your problems when it comes to deliverability. So make sure you got that and, and, and scale slowly as well. Like if you scale, like you double overnight, there are chances that suddenly some problems will appear as well. So list, make sure you still contact people of good quality, like the people who should receive that the content, make sure that the thing that they are receiving is of value to them and they won't flag you as spam. And engagement means like people are going to click being uh, curious and being starting a conversation with you. If you have those and between 10 and 20% reply rates, there is no reason in why you can't really scale. But there is a right way and a bad way of scaling. The bad way of scaling is using the same inbox and then, like I mentioned, doubling it, going very quickly. That will lead to problems very quickly. And then you'll have to restart the process, which is you have to scale down fix the deliverability issues, maybe put the, the inbox on cooldown until this comes back. And then after that, re, 
regrow slowly. That is a lot of a lot of um, time wasted by doing that. So the safest way of scaling is doing the load balancing, which is inbox rotation. You actually have multiple inboxes per campaign. Historically speaking, for that was really hard to achieve because you needed to obviously clone a campaign for every inbox you had. So if you wanted to add like a top, which is three to six inboxes, then you'll have to have like three to six uh, campaigns to manage, which means if you want to perform A-B testing, this is problematic uh, because you'll have to duplicate it through all your all your campaigns. Uh, this is also hard to look at stats and so on. So you will want, but nowadays um, with QuickMail and I think um, maybe another tool that does it, but tool are starting to pick up on that. Like you can effectively add multiple inboxes per campaign, which helps you to actually load quite safely because now you're scaling on an inbox level and not necessarily on the one uh, particular inbox, but you add multiple inbox. And if one of those inbox has problems, you can always like remove that inbox and then let it cool down or replace it with another inbox, which allow you to keep on increasing the volume while staying under the radar. And I also put the variable delay here because it's kind of a luxury, but it's a time between emails that you're sending. And it needs to be variable. Otherwise, it's too easy to pick up that is done through automation. Um, I mean, in QuickMail, for example, you have a, um, um, a, a settings that allow you to add an extra variable time on top. So if you say, for example, every 30 seconds, I should send a new email, you can add a variable time, maybe 15 seconds, and then it will send a, between each email, it will send either 30 seconds plus a random number between one and 15 seconds. So it will be sending either between 30 seconds and 45 seconds, and we keep on varying, which makes it more human. And that works very well when you're actually scaling. Whew. All right, so coming to an end, uh, what did we cover? So we have covered how to assess deliverability. We covered how to reduce spam complaint. We covered how to increase engagement and how to scale safely. Here's what's coming next for you guys. Uh, first is we're going to look at our giveaway winners. Um, we're going to get that out of the way, hopefully make three people super happy. Then we're going to move into Q&A, live Q&A, and you're going to receive a free copy of the Deliverability PDF, which hopefully will uh, cover most of the points here. I don't know for sure. Uh, it's one of our marketing guys that actually assembled it for us, and um, um, I'll double check it. And so, we'll, uh, and if it's not good, then you know, just send us back, and then we'll, uh, we'll revisit it and we'll improve it. Anyhow, um, type yes! Uh, exclamation mark while I read your chat, guys. Can you type yes! Exclamation mark if you learn at least two things during this webinar. So I make sure. Okay. Wow. Cool. We got plenty of yeses already. Well, that's awesome. Uh, that's really what I like uh, to see, guys. Uh, so that's really cool. Thanks, Fabrizio, for the uh, quick mail uh, inbox rotation. is amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, da for Tom. Uh, that's that's pretty cool. You can type yes in your language. That'll be fun too. Um, okay, someone is asking for the recording. I'll see if it works. If it works, then yes, for sure. Uh, we'll add that into uh, into your thank you email that we're going to send for attending. Now. Uh, I'm going to stick around for the live Q&A. Um, I want, first of all, to thank everyone who joined it. I'm super pumped that you guys learned a few things. If you have more questions, do not hesitate to reach out to us and just you know mention as the subject line a webinar and then just mention your question into it. And then I'll revise my webinar for making it better for future people. And at the same time, I'll answer your question. Uh, so I want to thank you, everyone. And for now, if you have some questions, I know some people had some questions. I didn't have time to um, to look at them during the webinar. But if you have some questions, I think now is the time. And thank you, everyone, again for attending. Okay, Meg, can I please elaborate on the iOS 15 update removing click tracking? It's more than the click tracking; it's also the open tracking. Uh, I think even more the open tracking than the click tracking. I think the click tracking will keep on working. Sorry, the problem with click tracking is that it's um, it's a too low number, so it makes it hard to multiply. What I mean by that is, if you have a campaign of hundred people and then two clicks on it, or three clicks on it, like two three percent, and it's hard to figure out. Like, if I move my campaign to be five hundred, am I going to multiply by five those numbers? 
right? And then the other thing is that not everyone clicks, not everyone has a clicking campaign kind of thing. So it, it makes it re really super hard. What iOS 15 is going to do, the next update is it's going to basically remove all those sort of like invisible one pixel use for open tracking as a technology uh, overall. And I think in the future that's going to be removed. So we have to figure out other ways. And I think the auto warmer, um, sending automatically emails to unknown inbox and then basically doing the sampler, uh, the sampling thing that we discussed during the webinar, I think it's going to be the future definitely to assess your availability. You have tools like Lockapps that goes a little bit deeper into that. Uh, but honestly, I think, um, I personally think uh, that I don't need anything more than uh, the auto warmer at this stage because Glockaps is really great in terms of it's going to do everything. It's going to do you your deliverability rate for yahoo.com, for gmail, at gmail.com and stuff like that. But honestly, when I contact businesses, no one is on yahoo.com. No one is on hotmail.com. It's like those things are not necessary for me. 90% of the market on a B2B is on, is on Google. That's That's good enough for me. Um, I'm going to take random, random question. How do you calculate reply rates uh, by person or by total of emails? Uh, by person. So the reply rate is like if I send to 100, uh, 100 people, like how many of those 100 will actually reply? If, um, if there are some bounces, they're removed from the total. So for example, if I send to 101 people and, I, um, and then one person bounces, then honestly, there is just 100 people. So if you get three replies, it's 3%. Right, it's not three dot something because there is hundred one. Right. Um, how would you modify the approach for B two C for Gmail, Yahoo, and so on? Like I mentioned, go through influencers, uh, contact the people on YouTube, people have the contact on Twitter, people, all those influencers that will be happy because they have like a more commercial mindset, and so they'll be more happy to engage with you. Uh, uh, another question, but a suggestion to be able to send test email from a specific uh, email address, example, clients or mail tester. Yeah, I like the idea. Um, well, um, please submit that to uh, support at quickmail.io and then we'll put it probably in, uh, somewhere in a, in a roadmap. That's something that was on the back of my head for some time now. Uh, Oh, that's a good question. Why are my emails in spam in Glockaps, but not in spam in QuickMail? I think it's because Glockaps, you have their own uh, email addresses, their own inboxes that they own. They don't actually use the one that are of like normal people in a sense. Uh, I think they, that makes some, some differences. Also, it could be that uh, some of the inbox either have been tampered with or um, the, or have been identified as, you know, uh, Tumper reads, like for example, if, um, I, and I know that they actually look sometime at their own inbox and if someone actually just press on, on spam or some stuff like that, then most e messages that fit the same thing will just end up on spam. So there are some stuff you don't want to tamper with. Um, that makes it more difficult to figure it out. Uh, over, and the otherwise, the, the thing that we have to think in mind is that it's always a black box. So it makes it always very difficult, uh, to figure out exactly what the reason. We can only do conjecture and hypothesis. But so far, that's my, my best hypothesis. Um, a question that comes up multiple times is uh, what is a good number of prospects to contact per day uh, per inbox? Or what is the limit before you need to implement inbox rotation? Fantastic question. Um, this is what, uh, like I mentioned, this is a black box. Uh, so that's only the thing that we realized. And also things and direction we can give now may not be applicable in one month's time or even one week, depending if Google changed the algorithms or, or, or other email service provider change the algorithms. Right now, um, lots of people have very a lot of success by doing per inbox 20 prospects right a day maximum kind of thing. So obviously in terms of email, that's a bit more, but that's the idea, like 20 prospects per day per inbox. I think it's a really good, healthy number. It forces you as well that, right, if you're not getting enough uh, enough, uh, enough replies, you're gonna have to increase either the number of inbox, but then in this case, um, it becomes economically problematic. So you have to just make the balance between the efforts you're spending into prospecting and the actual uh, scaling by number of inbox. This is also why we don't make it free. We used to make it much cheaper, like five years ago. Since then, we didn't change our pricing, by the way. But we used to have a cheaper thing, and there were a lot of like uh, Indian spammer coming into our system and using it, and just like you know, creating lots of things. And because it was economically safe, now we actually raise the price a little bit. Like five years ago, we didn't change the price compared to all our competitors, actually. Uh, so we're pretty stable on that end. And um, and then that makes it like completely economically um, 
non-economically uh, possible. So we have less spammer that way. We get a better crowd um, or, or shared URL is getting better. So all those things are actually improved. And I will recommend like you stick to like 20 prospects a day. If you're not getting the results that you need, revisit your thing. Don't try to increase. Like I mentioned, the scaling should come last when everything's just working and you got between 10 and 15. Well, 15 and 20% will be ideal in terms of reply rate. Um, uh, ideal interval between every follow-ups. Um, Oh, this is a this is an interesting question. We did a podcast cast about it. Like, how many, how much days should you wait between follow ups? I have a lot of success with one campaign where I put four hours between follow ups, um, and then basically the first email goes out, and then another email say I should probably have added this with a link, and that actually went pretty well. Um, but the value proposition was extremely appealing. It was like something like, hey, do you want to come on our podcast and basically get you know, touch a huge audience. And then the, by the way, here's the link was, um, uh, so they can, you know, check the podcast themselves. So overall, it actually, they make a lot of sense. Uh, I will look at the Fibonacci sequence, which is, um, I think, uh, two, then two, then four, whatever. It's to basically, you take the last number on the last number and then you add it and then that's the next number. So you got like two, five, eight, something like that. Actually, that should be three, five, eight. Anyway, um, that's a Fibonacci sequence. I think it works pretty well. Um, but otherwise, you can go with the default, which is like three business days. And I think that usually what's kind of the agreed um, uh, standardization of the moment. Uh, does it make to have an unsubscribe versus no subscribe link? Um, I always put a sort of like unsubscribe link unless this is like a very personal type of reach out. Um, the reason you have to ask yourself is that I would basically start with the unsubscribe and then see if people are unsubscribing. Because basically, if someone wants to unsubscribe, he's going to unsubscribe. Whether it clicks on your unsubscribe link or it clicks on the spam button, either of the two are going to be the unsubscribe for them. Um, in fact, I think I talked to the founder of SendGrid at some point um, when we had some spam issue like a few years back, uh, quite a lot, like probably like six years back. And basically, he was telling me that. Um, uh, it depends also on the country. Like he was in Turkey. Uh, the Turkey country apparently uh, were people in Turkey were actually like hitting the spam filter as a way to delete the email. <laughs> and so obviously that suddenly they are, they had like a massive like high rate of spam filter uh, of spam uh, complaint. But basically what you need to do is what you need to ask yourself is like um, if people really want to unsubscribe from my from my my thing, do I give them like an easy way out or do I actually you know let them click on the spam button? One thing that kind of work as well. If you're good in copywriting, you just let them know like, oh, PS, just let me know, you know, if, if this is not an interest for you, it's, it's more than fine. I'll stop any reach out, any outreach. Okay, let me take a couple of more questions. Um, if we need to send a link in an email, is it better to use anchor text or the full URL? Uh, I personally use no link at all. So I just basically type the right thing. But of course, if you do that, um, you're not going to be able to track the click. So you have to like to make a conscious move about it. But if you do that, then Gmail will automatically, uh, as a client, Gmail will automatically add the link. So for you, it's like for the user, it's no difference. Also, I think now people are more worried about like being tracked or they don't like that, right? I, I know I don't, for example, when I see a link with a track, especially when it's an encore and it's basically a click here kind of thing, like I'm not clicking here. Uh, that may be me, that may be because I'm a tough cookie, but basically it doesn't raise the, the, the level of trust. You have to imagine that uh, you have to balance your need for, um, for monitoring with your actual um, building of a trust relationship with your prospect. Like if I'm sending you an email and I'm already like, you know, Boring some of that trust relationship for my own personal gain on monitoring what I do. It's like, it's probably not a great relationship to start with, right? So I prefer to do just like, you know, full, full link. The open tracking is more than enough. And uh, I'll leave it at that most of the time. Actually, one thing that I do for the tracking is I disable it for the first touch. So first touch, no tracking, whether it's open or whether it's click. And I do it only on the follow up, right? That's, that's how I would do it. All right, last question. And then after that, uh, I'll have to uh, close. Um, what do we get? Um, mm -mm -mm. 
uh, okay, I'll, I'll just do this one uh, from Maget. I do, oh, sorry, this one I did. Um, Ma oh, sorry, maximum number of follow-ups. Uh, just to quickly take the follow-ups is going to be, uh, it depends on you. It's, um, it's again a trade-off between how people will flag you as spam if they're really not engaged. So one thing you can do is in your sequence, maybe after two, three touch, you look at, did they at least open once or did they at least click once? If they didn't stop the sequence there and if they didn't and they did, uh, then you may effectively like give like maybe two, three more emails because a lot of things in call outreach is about, uh, it's about timing. So did you hit that person at the right time where they had this problem? There are problems you can't really know. Like let's say for example, I'm in a hiring, you know, a hiring company or translation company, then, you know, if that company, uh, the company I'm reaching out to doesn't need translation right now, it's very difficult to figure out, do they need it or right? But if they don't need it right now, they may not answer me, but maybe in three months time, if I hit them with the email and that's the time where they need that translation, they may think like, oh, well, okay, let me just reach out to them. And that's, um, that's the magic of um, cold outreach. And it's not always easy to figure out when. All right, uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining the webinar. We went a little bit over time, uh, but hopefully I gave you a lot of value. And like I would say on, on, on YouTube, thumbs up if you like it, subscribe, but there is no subscribing, there's no thumbs up. Have fun everyone. And thank you everyone for turning up.